Hello there. Not only was I waving to say hi to you, but I was also waving my hand over this solar cell, which I've connected to a Raspberry Pi computer. The solar cell collected data for one second using this program called Solar Cell. So if I press enter, we can see that the signal received by this solar cell, aka the voltage, changes as my hand blocks and unblocks the light. But look at this background noise here. What's with all these wiggles? Okay, forget the hand. Let's just capture the background oscillations. Look, these are actually very well behaved. We can extract out a frequency of these oscillations. Let's pause for a second. What would be the most rudimentary way to extract out a frequency? Well, what we could do is count the number of cycles of the oscillation which occur in this one second, and that would be our frequency, right? However, that's pretty inefficient, subject to error, and we want a more systematic way to analyze signals. So instead, let's see what happens when I input this data into my Fourier transform program. And look what's been produced. It's now clear as day that our signal peaks at 120 hertz. No cycle counting required. All right, so clearly what happened is we had some sort of signal, some voltage as a function of time, and then we fed it into some interesting kind of transformation here, which ultimately gave us this output, right? So we already have the answer kind of staring in front of us, and what we're going to do is we're going to unpack this. We're going to work backwards and understand more and more and more until we can fully put together what this program was actually doing here. And through that process, we're going to learn actually a lot about the Fourier transform and its utility. All right, but first things first, we can clearly see that we have this peak here centered at 120 hertz, and that is indeed the strongest frequency in this signal on the left here. And so, you know, why do we actually have that frequency? Well, I want to point out that we did this Fourier analysis on home lights. And so what's the actual physics there? Well, how do we actually get electricity right off of the grid? That is going to be coming in as an AC current, right? But in order to make use of that at our home, we want to convert that AC signal into a DC signal. All right, and the way that we do that is through the use of what is called a rectifier circuit. I'm showing an example here called a full wave bridge rectifier. And what we can see is that through the strategic use of these clamping diodes here, right, that leads to kind of this purple curve here, along with this strategically placed capacitor, we can see that this red signal here, this alternating signal Vn has been converted to this effective DC signal, this green curve here, V out. Right, but we can see that this output voltage still has some very small oscillations in it. So what's the actual value of the signal our home is receiving from our AC grid, right? That is 60 hertz. But then when we transform it, you can see this sign flip here due to the diodes, okay? And so that leads, right, to our peak-to-peak -peak distance getting cut in half. Do you see that super clearly? And so the ultimate frequency of this output wave here doubles. It becomes 120 hertz, right? And ultimately, as the light comes and interacts with my solar cell, all of those little oscillations are still present and we get that 120 hertz peak. But the nice thing about the Fourier transform, and we can already see this really nice application, we don't just get the 120 hertz frequency, we also see, you know, these little smaller peaks too, right? These little harmonics, in fact, due to the non-linearities in our load. All right, but we should be feeling motivated now by this example, which really was effectively carrying out an experiment, collecting our data, transforming that data into a more legible format, which then allows us to make conclusions about our universe. Okay, so now I just went ahead and wrote out the actual definition of the Fourier transform, right? We have our input signal, which is a function of time. That's this guy on the left here, okay? And so this signal is actually what's in called the time domain, okay? And then by transforming it with this integral here, we are converting from the time domain to the frequency domain. 
I do want to point out that this one over root two pi here, this normalization factor appears quite a bit, but not necessarily always. All right, some of the cofactors here are ultimately going to be dependent on the context of the discussion. All right, so I want you to keep that in mind that you have to be careful if you're plugging into calculators and whatnot that are doing the Fourier transform for you, you need to be very clear on the exact context of what that's doing, right? And that's also sometimes gonna apply up here too, People can write out the Fourier transform in terms of angular frequency. Here I'm writing this directly in terms of just regular old frequency because that's kind of the example we're showing here. All right, and so with this video being an introduction, I want us to focus on the key ideas to get you comfortable with what this Fourier transform actually does. And then you can go through and focus on the details of, you know, doing these integrals yourself using complex analysis and all of that. Okay, so the first thing that I want us to try is putting in a g of t equal to sine of 2 pi f times t into this Fourier transform. Actually, let me go ahead and call this frequency f naught. And here we go, we have the result of doing that Fourier transform. Look, we have this linear combination of these two Dirac delta functions. One of them is centered at f naught, while the other is centered at minus f naught. And so this video is indeed designed as an introduction to the Fourier transform, and so I'm going to assume that maybe we haven't seen these Dirac delta functions before. And so I think the easiest way is just to show the result of a plot. I think a picture says a thousand words. And so what I'm plotting is just the imaginary component of our function here, right? So really I'm ignoring these eyes. All right, and again, on the x-axis, we have f, we are in our frequency domain. And what we can see is that these Dirac delta functions are effectively infinitely narrow, infinitely tall spikes, okay? So for example, if I look at this Dirac delta function, which is centered at positive f naught, right? It is a spike which goes to minus infinity, right? Because of this minus sign here. And if I look at this other Dirac delta function here, right? We have this infinitely tall spike centered at minus f naught. All right, so does this result of our Fourier transform make sense? Well, it's kind of showing us something neat here, right? That this sine function, which has a singular frequency f naught, right? We're seeing a singular frequency f naught on the positive side here, so that checks out, right? We convert from the time domain to the frequency domain, we should just see that frequency come out. But we also have this signal at minus f naught. It looks like we're actually splitting this sine curve into two frequencies, one at positive f naught and one at minus f naught, right? And we can actually see that manifesting in this one half factor here, and which really what we've done is we've split the energy of this sine curve into two halves, right? Or writing this out really literally, I could just rewrite this sine function as one half, right? times sine of 2 pi f naught t minus a sine of minus 2 pi f naught t. And of course, if we take this linear combination, we plot this together, this is just going to give us this original sine function, right? And so this splitting here is really just an artifact of this Fourier transform. And if you know how to transform a single sine wave, you can transform a linear combination of multiple sine waves added together, right? So in this example here, I'm using the Fourier transform to break this complicated signal of three signals down into these three peaks here. What I'm next really going to emphasize in this video, though, is how we're actually getting to this amplitude spectrum, you know. Okay, so let's start being clear about these details. Okay, so this is the direct result of transforming a sine function. But now we might have some questions. Look at this picture here, right? This was what I got from my program. It's not quite what we're seeing over on the right here, right? And there's a couple of differences. First, we only have positive frequencies. We don't have the second half of the picture here. The second thing we notice, no minus signals, right? And the final thing we notice, these peak at infinity, whereas my signals in this example here 
they definitely have a finite peak. In fact, it's very small. It's not even remotely close to plus or minus infinity. Okay, so these are kind of the important details that we have to be careful with when we're interpreting our results from our Fourier transforms. So we can imagine doing the following procedure. Step one, I'm just gonna take the magnitude of my transform components. See how each of these delta functions have a cofactor of one half? Yeah, let's just plot the one half on these, right? And again, because we're taking the magnitude, we're gonna ignore this minus sign here. Next, let's go ahead and ignore the minus frequency components. Let's just stick to the positive world. So I'm gonna ignore the negative frequencies, but I can't just delete that energy. We have to put that energy back in, right? So I'm going to double the positive on this right-hand side. And there we go. Now we have a plot of what is called the amplitude spectrum. Okay, and so now we're actually getting very close to being able to interpret the y-axis here on my Fourier analysis program. There's one last step. A lot of the time, it's less useful to think about amplitudes directly and instead actually think about the power of the signal that you're looking at. Okay, and so power goes like the square of the amplitude when you have a signal, right? And so generally, it's much more useful to actually consider the power of the signal. And so that is actually what is being plotted here with my little program. I am plotting the power spectrum of these home lights here. So indeed, if you take the square root of this y-axis here times two, that's gonna bring you very, very close to the magnitude of the signals that you're actually seeing in the original plot, right? Typically the units of your power spectrum, because really this is kind of interesting, you can think of this as like a, um, you know, a over square root two, this entire thing squared, right? And you define this as A sub RMS, like your root mean square amplitude, okay? And so sometimes you'll see the units on this y-axis here as RMS squared because you're then squaring that root mean square amplitude to get to power. All right, so those are the kind of steps that are actually happening to get from a Fourier transform to a more useful diagram, such as an amplitude spectrum. You can also create spectrums like a phase spectrum using phase information encoded in the Fourier transform. The last thing to kind of complete this introductory picture on the Fourier transform is I wanna talk about a couple more definitions. So the fundamental definition of the Fourier transform with the integral, right, is very useful for continuous periodic signals, right, which are defined from minus infinity to infinity. But in reality, right, when we have actual data, first off, our domain here is not going to range from minus infinity to infinity. We're going to be collecting the signal for a discrete amount of time, for example, from zero to one seconds, like in my solar cell collector, right? And second, when you're collecting data, you know, instead of having a continuous signal, you're just going to be getting, you know, collecting points, you know, at equally spaced intervals of time based on, you know, the sampling rate of your measurement device, like my solar cell, right? And so instead of using this, you know, very useful definition for continuous frequencies, there's actually a second set of definitions which deal with discrete data, and that's called the discrete Fourier transform. And then of course, the coders come along, you know, and come up with a bunch of algorithms in order to do those discrete Fourier transforms very, very quickly and efficiently, and those are called fast Fourier transforms. So those are some of the terms that you should have in your mind. But generally, you know, you're not doing these calculations directly, you're just running code, running functions, and all of these details here are kind of kept under the hood for you, but you should still know the terminology. All right, but anyways, I'm gonna end the video here. Thank you so, so much for watching.